Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 119, The Geography and Climate of Russia. Today's episode is a rather unique one, as it deals with, for the most part, with something that's not really historical, but is rather crucial in the history of this great nation. I'll also impart some historical material, like the size of the country as it grew from its early days of Kiev and Novgorod the Great, to its size when it was the Soviet Union, to today's Russia. As an adjunct, you can go over to my blog site at www.russianrulershistory.com to see maps of the various stages of Russia and information about its climate. Now, let's start off with the climate of Russia. One of the striking features of it is that there is essentially two main seasons, summer and winter. Fall and spring seem to only be short periods of transition from the two main seasons. Basically, there are five climactic zones in the country as it stands today. The first, and most famous of course, is the polar climate that covers the northern section of the country. There, one only has, at most, a 60-day growing season in July and August, where the temperatures just barely rise above freezing. There is little up there to subside on, so it is less habitable than other parts of Russia. Still, many a hardy person has made the trek up north and survived. Interestingly enough, St. Petersburg is on the western edge of this and the next zonal region. The second and by far the largest climactic region covering over two-thirds of the country is the subarctic zone. Immediately south of the polar climate, its growing season is still only 60 to 90 days and contains vast areas of permafrost and taiga. Taiga is a northern coniferous forest. The size of this area is larger than any country in the world. To put it into perspective, Russia has the world's largest forest reserves and is commonly known as the lungs of Europe. It is second only to the Amazon rainforest in the amount of carbon dioxide it absorbs, which makes it an extremely valuable region of the world. Next up is the humid continental zone, which is in the northwestern part of Russia. Its growing season is anywhere from 90 to 120 days with mixed forest and snowy regions. Looking at a map, this area borders the Ukraine and Belarus to the west. The fourth climactic zone is the arid continental to the south and west on the fringe of the Caspian Sea and furthest west is the semi-arid continental climate region. The former has the longest growing season of between 160 to 200 days, but it's mostly desert. The latter has about a 120 to 160 day growing season and is considered the breadbasket of Russia with vast regions of good black soil. The reliance of single crops in most of the country and small regions for multiple harvests is why Russia was so susceptible to famine. Throughout its history, going back to the days of Kievan dominance, drought, which comes every once in a while, could devastate the countryside. Think about it. You have only one harvest to count on for your food for the winter, and it doesn't rain. You starve, and starve the people did. In earlier podcasts, we talked about the famines around the time of Troubles in the early 1600s, but more recently, there were a number of devastating periods of drought, like the 1891-92 famine, which was precipitated by a dry spell during the usually wet spring in 1891. Preceded by a number of bad harvests in the years before, there were no reserves and the people starved. Much of the blame went on the shoulders of Nicholas II because his government didn't do enough to feed the people. The climate problems of Russia influenced public opinion against the Tsar, something that could no longer be suppressed. The famine of 1921 and 22 almost toppled the Bolshevik government as one quarter of all crops failed. On top of it, the Russian Civil War was raging on and the armies confiscated all food it could find, causing massive suffering, starvation, and millions of deaths. It was because of this famine that U.S. President Herbert Hoover asked Congress to put aside $20 million for humanitarian aid. It wasn't nearly enough, and many people couldn't get to the food because of transportation problems and the war. 
Next up, just 10 years later, was the famine of 1932 and 33. Stalin's forced collectivization policy had made the people less likely to work hard on the fields since so much of their labor was taken away from them. Add a drought and total incompetency of the local and central government, and you have yourselves another disaster in the making. At first, Stalin refused to acknowledge the drought, instead blaming the people for not doing their job. When he finally realized that the weather was the problem, it was too late to change the types of crops planted. Had they planted more drought-resistant crops, millions of people might have survived. Because of this, the Soviets arrested around 200,000 people and executed 8,000 of them because of this lack of foresight. Again, Russia's weather affected their history and their people. In researching the climate, I found that the harshness of the country increases as you go from west to east as the influence of the North Atlantic decreases. Here's a case in point. St. Petersburg, which is next to the Gulf of Finland, has a 45 degree Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius difference between the mean temperatures of January and July, with about an average of 19 inches of precipitation per year. Contrast that to Yakutsk in eastern Siberia, which has a 112 degree Fahrenheit or 65 degrees Celsius range of mean temperatures for the same period and only four inches of precipitation a year. When it comes to latitude, Moscow is on about the same northerly line as Edmonton, Canada, and St. Petersburg is the same as Anchorage, Alaska. This means that over nine-tenths of the country lies above the 50th parallel. Another important feature of Russia is how little of the land is above 1,500 feet or 450 meters above sea level. The significance of this is that the lack of mountainous areas does not provide the lift necessary and friction needed to allow for rain and snow. It also makes for more massive thunderstorms in the summer months. The temperature gradient of Russia is one of the greatest in the world, with a record low in January being about minus 96 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 71 Celsius, and the record high being 113 degrees Fahrenheit, or 45 degrees Celsius. In northeast Siberia, though, you get the coldest average temperatures outside of Antarctica at a bone-chilling minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 45 degrees Celsius. That's the average. So how did the Russian climate affect the history of the country? Hello, have you listened to this podcast? We have the winters that crushed the invasions of Charles XII, Napoleon, and Hitler to begin with. Of course, the vastness of the country helped with those three as well, but we'll get to that later. The climate hardened the people, but may also be the culprit behind its health problems. Aside from the lack of vitamin D due to the low amount of sunlight, the long and harsh winters kept people indoors, and oftentimes drinking lots of vodka became some of the only entertainment they had. But the cold climate also, in my humble opinion, was a driving force as to how deeply ingrained the Russian Orthodox Church became in the lives of the people. The church was a place of solace, a place where a meaning could be found to the harsh life the majority of the people led. It was sometimes the one warm place the Russians could go to and pray for a life after their time on earth was over, a time after which they suffered so much and they felt that the afterlife was a much better place for them. Now aside from the climate, the geography of Russia has played a very important part of its history and the influence it played on its people. When you think of Russia, you think of this vast, massive land that is 1.7 times larger than the second biggest country, Canada. To put things into perspective, Russia is 10 times bigger than Alaska and 25 times larger than the state of Texas. Another great mind visual on the sheer size of the country comes from the Encyclopedia of Russian History. Quote, if Russia was superimposed on North America with St. Petersburg in Anchorage, Alaska, the Chuchi Peninsula would touch Oslo in Norway, halfway around the world. 
Thus, when Russians are eating supper on any given day in St. Petersburg, the Chukchi are breakfasting on the next. From its southernmost point, 45 degrees north, to its northernmost islands, 82 degrees north, the width of Russia exceeds the length of the contiguous United States. Just sit on those images in your head for a moment. But of course, this was not always the case, obviously. In the early days when the Kievan state existed, it was tiny in comparison. The city of Lagoda was to the northwest border. Belozersk to the northeast. Murom was the furthest east, with Kursk on the southeast corner. Further south was Peryaslavl, which was close to Kiev, and in the middle was Smolensk. On one side to the east of the Kievan state were the hostile Volga Bulgars and Pechenegs. To the west was Poland and Lithuanians. When the state expanded, it headed east to the cities of Grodno and Perimyshel, and west to Ryazin. Then came the Mongols to throw everything out the window. From 1219 to 1241, the Tatar conquest took over most of the Kievan state, with only the Republic of Novgorod escaping total domination. Once Moscow began to spread its wings, the expansion of Russia truly began. Ivan III, known as the Gatherer of Lands, began to take large chunks of land into his holdings. Ivan IV followed, by, followed the expansion by going all the way to Siberia in 1585. One of the most important features of the geography of Russia isn't just its size, but the expansive river routes which allowed for trade between cities great distances apart. And at the center of all of it was Moscow in the east. It was close to the Oka and the Don, which allowed it to send merchandise through the Volga to the Caspian Sea and the Sea of Azov next to the Black Sea. Much of the expansion of the Russian lands was in part caused by the invasion of the Golden Horde, which caused people to head into largely inhospitable areas to escape their wrath. And of course, many of the monasteries built from the Russian Orthodox Church were in those areas where men would go away because of just the horrors that they saw due to the Mongol invasion. And they would build these monasteries, build these churches far, far away from where the Mongols could even go to or even wanted to go to. Now, many of the people also left the comfort of their homes because of the repression of their rulers, like Ivan IV, which caused many in the Novgorodian region to flee his reach. They were the first to cross the Urals in large numbers. Cossacks and escaping peasants were also part of this eastward migration. By 1700, over 200,000 Russian settlers were found east of the Ural mountain range. The geography and climate of Russia also greatly influenced its trade and the products available. The northern fur industry was legendary, going both eastward to China and west to Europe. The land is also rich in iron ores, which was treasured by the Europeans during the Renaissance and, of course, the Industrial Revolution. Because of the river systems, large quantities of timber, iron, grain, and flax could be moved easily. Peter the Great and later Catherine II continued the expansion, taking over parts of Poland, Lithuania, and slices of Finland. This massive expansion caught the eye of Europe and made them very, very nervous. The Russian bear had arisen, and so by the time of the defeat of Napoleon, the concern was very great. This expansion, in part, was the leading cause of the Crimean War, a topic I shall delve into in the future as a multi-part podcast. At this point, we have Russia at about its limits. It's been said that there are more resources within Russia than any other country by far. The problem is, something is only a resource if you're able to get to it. With the vast distances from where the resources are, to where they can be used, it's so great that it really isn't a resource after all. Transportation costs outstrip the value, so it lays there dormant, waiting for a future generation to develop techniques of not just extraction, but of transportation. 
This problem is part of why Russia never really was able to become the greatest nation on earth in form of riches. It simply couldn't get to its wealth. In the United States, they're large enough to have a lot of resources, but small enough to transport them. Also, remember the U.S. has coastal access, whereas Russia has struggled to get to the sea. It's still kind of largely a landlocked nation with sea access for only limited times to the north, and that, of course, has stifled its economy. When you look at the Russian map, you have to notice the Great Divide, and it's caused by the clash of two continents, Europe and Asia, and the result being the Ural mountain range. It effectively splits the country, making travel more difficult. Not only is travel hard, but imagine trying to govern a country like this. Sending an order to someone in Ekaterinburg from Moscow, which in Russian distances isn't really that far, it's made harder with the Urals in between. Now let's think about the Tsar, making some changes to national laws and having to get the message out to a place like Irkutsk. The distance between the two cities is over 5,000 kilometers, or about 8,000 miles. In days of yore, that trip from Moscow to Irkutsk could take years at great peril to the people making the trek. Imagine, if you will, a message about a legal change makes it to Irkutsk, but there's a question as to how to implement the new law, or they just don't understand it. Back to Moscow you go, and a few years later, maybe, you finally get to Irkutsk again, but the official you dealt with originally is dead. You have to start all over again. That's a totally inefficient way to run a government, yet they had to do it that way until the advent of telephones and telegraphs. But think of that. That was difficult in and of itself. In Europe, cities are relatively close together, so stringing up wires is not too hard. In Russia, you have to lay incredibly long wires across vast distances to open communication lines. Knock one of those lines down, and it could take weeks or months to figure out what was wrong. But one thing that probably had the greatest influence on Russian history is the size of the country protecting it from two major invasions, that of the French and Napoleon and Hitler and the Nazis. Imagine the lines of supply to the front-line troops, how long and thin they have to be. They would have been very susceptible to attack. No need for a giant wall. Just long stretches of grasslands, coniferous forests, and the cold tundra, most unable to allow for the soldiers to live off the land. Only the Mongols could have handled this size of territory, mainly because of their horses and the direction they attacked from, the west. As they attacked eastward, you butt up against other European countries and people. Attack westward, and all you have at your back as you retreat is more and more land thousands and thousands of miles of inhospitable land. But it's your land. As you think back on all the podcasts about the Russian rulers, think of the difficulties these people had in governing a country as vast, cold and harsh, and you can see why so few of them were very effective. Only with better technology and transportation systems do we today have a governable country. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to come and visit my blog site at www.russianrulershistory.com. And if you choose, make a donation to the podcast, which would be greatly appreciated to avoid having to solicit advertisers. And as I mentioned on my uh, Facebook page, I'm going to be donating 25% of everything that we uh, raise here on the podcast to Kiva.org to help entrepreneurs around the world in poor countries and in countries with a lot of strife to make a better life for themselves. Also, don't forget to stop by that Russian Rulers History Facebook page where you can join the growing community and where you can ask a question, make a comment, or leave a suggestion. And now, as always, I leave you with Das Vidanya и спасибо большое.